Become a sponsor today by visiting patreon.com backslash psychology is. Welcome to the Psychology Is podcast. I am Nick Fortino, and it's very exciting today to be joined by Dr. Stephen Costello, who is a practicing logotherapist and also plays many other roles as well and helps to teach other professionals how to carry out logotherapy. And that is exactly the reason that I reached out to you and, and wanted to have this conversation. I consider Viktor Frankl, who of course is the founder of logotherapy, to be truly one of my heroes and one of the psychologists whose work I've studied most closely and been most impacted by. So this is exciting for me and I'd love to dive deeply into the nature of logotherapy and what this is, how what it's oriented toward, how it's different from other forms of therapy. And then, you know, perhaps talk about some of the specific techniques and philosophy behind oh. it. So again, thank you very much for joining me. How are you today? Pleasure. And it's great to have this um, space to talk to you, especially about Viktor Frankl and logotherapy and existential analysis. All good. I'm coming to you from Dublin and it's not raining, which is miraculous for October. Yes. This guy, and I've just finished seeing a few patients. Uh, interestingly, Frankl keeps the word patient. And he uses it not in a medical sense. We tend to think patient and a lot of humanistic psychotherapists like the word client. Um, but he keeps it because of its etymology in Latin, passio, meaning the suffering subject, he who suffers. And mm -hmm. we're all suffering subjects. We're speaking subjects and suffering subjects. So those who come to a logotherapist, an existential analyst, are usually suffering. There's some conversation that's stopped or stalled. Uh, and they're looking for a new orientation to meaning, and that's what orders our life, this orientation to meaning. Frankl had put it beautifully in one of my favourite quotes, like iron filings in the magnetic field, man's life is put in order through his orientation to meaning. And that's what the Lakas is. So the aim really is to order and orient our life towards the Lakas, meaning meaning or spirit in a non-religious sense. Beautiful. What about Viktor Frankl's biography mm -hmm. stands out to you? There's some certain obvious things like that he was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, but what details of his biography do you think are worth highlighting right now for anyone who's not familiar with this man? Um, our way into Frankl's life is usually via man's search for meaning, which was voted one of the most influential books ever written by uh, by the American Library or Cong Congress, Library of Congress, or forgotten the name, the full name of it. And um, in that, he gives his account of his Holocaust experience. He spent um, three years in um, a number of, three and a half years, I think in four concentration camps, briefly in Auschwitz, longer in Theresienstadt and the others. And he details his experiences. Now, one would think that would be very depressing. But in fact, when you read Frankl's account, what comes across to most people, which is extraordinary, isn't just the person and his suffering, but it's his attitude, his mindset to suffering. As he said, the Nazis took everything from me. They took my liberty, my profession, my wife, my children, my country. The only thing they didn't take was the attitude inside my own mind. And he called that the last of the human freedoms. So any logotherapist will try and orient the patient towards the logos, as I said a minute ago, but also to his attitude, his mindset to life. It's a bit like what Epictetus, the old Stoic, said. It's not the events in the world that hurt or harm us. It's the interpretation the mind puts on them. You know, it's what we do with them. So, so Frankl uh, quotes Nietzsche a lot. He who has a why to live for can cope with almost any how. So it's that mixture of why, the philosophical question, but how, how do I meet this? And of course, we don't court suffering. Uh, and the meaning, by the way, isn't in the that of suffering, the fact that we're suffering. The meaning, the possible or potential meaning, 
is in the how and what we do with our suffering, how we deal with what he calls blows of fate. So there's a slight difference there. The difference really being, of course, the difference between masochism and heroism. Um, and about heroism, he says, one can only ever ask it of oneself, never of another. So that brings me back more explicitly to answering your question. What struck me in his life was his heroic attitude, was his meaningful mindset, was how he dealt with blows of fate in the most stunning way when he's um, chopping um, uh, wood in the forest and he talks about the angels lost in perpetual contemplation of an infinite glory. I mean, how he thinks of that rising above his psychophysical facticity. And that's one of the techniques we might talk about later called de-reflection. This ability to rise up and over um, our body-mind amalgam. Um, so I think about his life is, what I think about his life is that it's heroic. His words matched his actions. Um, a lot of 20th century philosophers, I think you have Heidegger and Sartre and Lacan, didn't behave that well. I mean, Heidegger was a full-blown Nazi. I'm not detracting from some of his work like Simon Zeit, but as Levinas said about it, when reading it, he felt like washing his hands, detecting in the pages an echo of evil. But Frankel, who actually was friendly with Heidegger, uh, paradoxically, his life measured up. He was, he didn't preach that which he didn't live. And logotherapy was formulated prior to his incarceration in these awful concentration camps. But it's there that he experienced in the living laboratory, uh, if you if you will, logotherapy at work. And that consolidated and confirmed his researches. So another, of course, little book which he wrote about his life is called um, Oh, um, Reflections. Uh, we'll come back to me in a second. I'm, I'm starting to reach out for there. But it's a little book on his life. Recollections, recollections. I do learn mm. so many books around me. Recollections. And he goes through his life pretty systematically um, from when he was a young teenager, interested in asking that question, what's the meaning of life? And he remembers asking it explicitly. To then, I, I don't know if you know this, the most amazing story when things were getting very dark in Vienna at the time and the Nazis were prowling the streets and doing what they were doing uh, in the most dastardly way. He got his visa to go to the States. He could have emigrated. And his parents were urging him to escape. They knew what was happening. They said, for God's sake, you're a young man. You're a, you know, a newly qualified psych psychiatrist. Leave. And he went for a walk. And during this walk, he prayed for what he beautifully called a hint from heaven. And when he came back, he saw that his father was holding some broken marble. And he said, what's on it? dad or father and his father said it was from one of the burnt synagogues and it's one of the ten commandments and victor asked which one and his father said the one that says honor thy father and thy mother so that they, thy days may be long in the land of the living and his hair stood up and he found in that um a confirmation a kind of serendipitous or synchronistic event and he let the visa go and he stayed and indeed, his his life was long in the land of the living. Um, but they were shortly arrested and brought to the camps and his father died in his arms. His mother died as well. His sister escaped to Australia, but they pretty much all died. And um, he endured it through hope and faith and belief, um, through meaning and helping his um, inmates. That's kind of self-transcendence. This ability, as Heidegger puts it, to devote and dedicate ourselves to a cause greater than ourselves, to kind of stretch beyond ourselves, self-transcendence. And he felt that that was the essence of human existence. Um, he also set up a suicide watch to try and stop people committing suicide. And he set one up indeed in Vienna as well as the, the concentration camp, whichever one he was in at the time. And that was very successful. So he, 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 he probably saved a lot of people um, in the camps by falsifying some of the documents, the medical documents, because if they were regarded as schizophrenic, they would have been immediately gassed. He himself was very nearly exterminated. He was in two, there were two queues, and I think it was Dr. Mengele who would tap people on one shoulder, you know, left to go into the gas chambers, right to go to work in the camps. And he was, he was quite thin at the time, and he was 
oh, quite always then, but he was touched on one shoulder and that was supposed to go, he was supposed to literally walk straight in to the gas chamber, but he saw somebody in the other queue and just walked over, not, not realising, of course, nobody knew where the queues were going, just now realising, oh, I'll just walk over to that queue, not spot it, not punish, and that probably saved his life. I mean, undoubtedly, it did save his life. So there were extraordinary events at play uh, and interestingly, in Recollections, he does talk about synchronistic events, which Jung talks about a lot. And he said, I don't have the wisdom to understand them, but nor am I foolish enough to dismiss them. So he left it open as, as an interesting question that he didn't want to close or foreclose. Um, and he wrote, I think, 30, 33 books, nine or 10 of which have been translated into English. A lot of uh, Victor Frankel Institutes, including my own, have been set up all around the world. He was originally didn't put his name. He wanted to be anonymous from death camp to existentialism, translated later as Man's Search for Meaning, and gave a lot of lectures and was awarded a lot of prizes and doctoral, honorary doctorates throughout the world and, and died in his 90s. So he did live a full life and his life was really spanned the whole 20th century. And I have a little uh, drawing he drew in my study where I see patients. In, and in Germany, he's, it's a picture of one of his dawdlings of, I think it's Adler first, Freud and Frankel. And, and Frankel portrays himself or draws himself as being a small little person. The others are big. But he does say, I w I'm a dwarf standing on the shoulder of giants. But it just so happens the dwarf can see further than the giants themselves. Yeah. So his life kind of went through the 20th century. And logotherapy really was formulated um, not as an alternative, but to to complement the existing therapies. It, it's a kind of open systems therapy. So it fits nicely with other ones, um, like CBT, like psychoanalysis. I initially trained as a psychoanalyst, actually. My first training was long and expensive and deep and a few times a week on a couch. So I trained initially as a psychoanalyst and I would still be quite analytical. What drew me to Frankel was it was practical, it was philosophical, it was spiritual without being denominational or religious. So it kind of added something to my practice, which was Freud and Jung. Even though nowadays the institutes are split, you either do a Freudian training or Kleinian or you do a Jungian. The, the strangeness of the institute I tra trained in was that it was set up to provide both trainings at the same time, which is very unusual. So I would have had equal, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, teaching in Freud and Jung and later Lacan and Melanie Klein. So Frankel for me came later as an adjunct and um, I felt that it was very, um, it, it didn't clash at all. In fact, Frankel is very pro-Freud and he says in one of his books, the seat that's left vacated by Freud should be left permanently empty. You know, no one can live up to him. So he doesn't negate Freud. He adds, he critiques some of it, but he adds to it in his own way, the philosophical insights and the spiritual insights. And in relation to spirit, I just want to clear up that the word in German is Geist, and it doesn't have the religious connotation it does for us in English. So he will talk about in his tridimensional ontology, the view of the human being in three dimensions, soma, which is body, that's our biology, psyche, which is kind of mind and feelings, and then the noose, the noetic, or spirit in English. But he didn't particularly like the English translation. So the noetic or the noological is that part of us in us which is specifically human. It's the human in the human, if you like. It's all about our search for meaning, culture, nature, art, religion, the unconscious God. It's all that stuff is in the noetic. So he has a very tight open systems approach and integrated philosophical anthropology based on his tripartite view of the human being, which goes all the way back to Plato, that we are part biology, we are part psychology, but we're also, if you like, part spirituality. And he honours all three dimensions and he grounds it also in the social. So it seemed to me I was missing maybe a piece of the jigsaw that he, he enabled me to use a kind of language that was coherent, concise, comprehensive um, and integral. It brought all the strands together. So that's what, that was the ultimate appeal. And to the man, I never met him, which was a great regret, um, but I met his wife, um, who's in her late 90s a few times, Ellie, uh, an amazing woman. Uh, I think it was Jacob Needleman, the American philosopher, who called 
uh, Ellie, the warmth that accompanied the light. So when I met her, I said it was a, it's an honour, um, Mrs. Franklin, to meet the warmth that accompanied the light. And we joked about a few things and we had a good chat and she, she's an outstanding lady. And in fact, I would have to say the Frankel family, including Fra Dr. Frankel's son-in-law, uh, Franz Vesley, um, who's a physicist, and his grandson, who I know as well, Alexander Vesley, are charming, amazing people. So there's something about his extraordinary character that is in all the family. Um, and, they, and they are an amazing, extraordinary and lovely family. And it's a privilege to have met them and know them. And, and it's also lovely because in a lot of therapies, the founding fathers are dead. So we don't have that living connection. And with, with Frankel, you can just pop over to Vienna and, and it's alive and it's, you know, it's still there. So that's, that's really extraordinary for, for those of us who, who follow him. Beautiful. Wow. And meaningful. Yeah. So I'd love to, first of all, thank you for, you know, everything you just shared and so many of those details. I was not aware of and I'm quite touched and inspired by even the, the detail. Like I, I had known that he let a visa expire and chose not to immigrate so that he could stay with his parents. But I didn't know that synchronistic event that really led to that. And mm. it's extremely inspiring. Yeah. I would love to zoom in for a moment on the difference, the complementary differences between psychoanalysis and logotherapy. And the one thing I'll, I'll say to one of the aspects of his biography that really strikes me is the fact that he was corresponding with Sigmund Freud when he was a teenager. And that to me hi kind of highlights he was something of a prodigy. He was giving public lectures at the age of 15, I believe. He was writing essays that were being read by professionals in the field at an extremely young age, corresponding with the man who was essentially at the time the god of psychology. And so, and, and of course, Freud was much older than him. So those details also strike me because it, it highlights that here we have this extremely unique combination of factors that gave rise to what I believe, who I believe to be one of the most influential psychologists of all time. And that is a, a basically a prodigy who was dealt the harshest blow life could deal um, with all the loss, all the horror, the, the hellacious nature of what he had to live through. And then we had 50 more years with him after he was released from the death camps. And so we had all that time for him to, you know, speak his wisdom to the world, give his lectures, write more books, really refine his ability to kind of uh, articulate his insight so that you know what a gift um so just wanted to highlight that but also zoom in again on the the complementary differences between psychoanalysis and logotherapy and maybe i'll just say the the kind of simple way that i differentiate between the two and honestly i forget where i read this first it might have been frankel it might have been commentary on frankel but the way I've understood the difference between psychoanalysis and logotherapy is that psychoanalysis emphasizes looking backward and inward into one's past and into the depths of one's psyche. And logotherapy emphasizes looking forward and outward, not necessarily as much into one's past, but toward one's future and not necessarily into the depths of oneself, but to other people and to other causes that I can serve. So it's kind of this, and obviously both are important. It's important to look back inward, and it's important to look forward and outward. So that's just kind of my simple explanation of the difference, but I would love to hear you elaborate upon that correct that if necessary it's and spot on. I think at one stage Franco says in psychoanalysis you sit on the couch and you speak a lot and the analyst is in silence whereas in logotherapy the therapist might talk at you a lot um, the the problem I had with using only a couch and me sitting behind and the patient sitting in line on it was that you're almost caught up in an autistic bubble of free associations 
and they can escape you so they're not they're not quilting points they're not hanging on something they're just vaguely emerging in the air and they float around and there's no signified and the analyst listens and puns and and I felt a bit unfulfilling and slow and logotherapy while it does have I mean the full name is LTEA logotherapy and existential analysis so we tend to cut it in short sense you know therapy but it is also analysis and but the analysis is existential and that's exactly the point you're making that it's not just psychodynamic we're not just looking in on our psyches it's existential meaning it's me in the world in all my dimensions you know bodily social psychic spiritual so um it's an unfolding or unveiling unraveling of all my existence all the dimensions of my being so in that sense it's existential a bit different from heidegger a bit different from binswanger and boss but nonetheless it, it has its own specific approach the logotherapeutic side is some of the techniques like paradoxical intention de-reflection attitudinal modification um but psychoanalysis is a few times a week it's very long for years and years and years logotherapy and existential analysis is shorter we start with the present with the symptom if you like and then we may have the causal analysis i remember frankl saying in one of his books if a building is on fire put out the fire then you can ask yourself what caused it so sometimes we need to just do just do symptom reduction and um, before we go into the causal things and also of course there is this kind of imaginary fantasy that in psychoanalysis you find the cause and everything is fine in the present but i mean if you go to your dentist and he says oh um you know eating sweets caused you to have this bad tooth so you now know the cause well so what you've still got to do something with the teeth you've got to have a filling or take them out or root canal so it always struck me as a bit strange assuming that you could locate one cause in the past which magically made everything better in the present that's that strict psychoanalytic approach doesn't work but an, an, an analytical approach can work if the analyst is a bit silent at times the odd time i do use the couch you get them to free associate or go into dreams i mean frankl did uh, agree with dream analysis um, and suggest we listen to the dreams of our patients so sometimes it would be good to use the couch on and off but that's kind of where i'm coming from because of my original training in psychoanalysis whereas a lot of logotherapists are cognitive behavioral therapists that was their first training they tend to be a bit more cognitive cbt oriented in the states a bit more analytical in on the continent especially in vienna germany etc italy so it just depends a lot depends on the practitioner actually and what he brings to the table um and also because i'm a philosopher i have a phd in philosophy my approach is very philosophical and frankel had a phd by the way as well as his md a phd in philosophy whereas some people love elizabeth lucas very famous you know living disciple of of frankel's written a ton of books and i like her approach but she's a psychologist and you kind of know the difference so my uh, humble or modest contributions to logotherapy with a book I, I wrote on clinical logotherapy a while back is coming from a more philosophical, clinical uh, dimension. Other people were psychologists really add to that dimension and maybe gravitate more to Elizabeth Lucas. Then you've got the neuroscientists who are very intent on uh, looking at it from a more uh, hardcore science base. So I think there's ways in for everybody and there's different strands you can pull out. And what appeals <coughs> excuse me, to me is the philosophical and the clinical and that's where where i i've made some contributions so um it does differ from psychoanalysis it differs from cbt i'll give you one clinical example a case i had many years ago somebody came to me because she 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 had a washing compulsion she was washing her hands an awful lot and the skin was coming off i think she was 17 she was certainly under 18 because her mother contacted me and she went to a cbt person and the cbt therapist practitioner said reduce your washing reduce washing hands so it was common sense it was rational it was encouraging 
And that worked for a while. And then it didn't work anymore. So when she came to me, the two approaches I took, one was to try and find out the cause. And when I say cause, I really mean contributing factors, you know, correlations, all sorts of things going on. Not, not causation. It's not as simple as that. It's not the scientific model of cause and effect. But what contributed to it? What precipitated or triggered it? And with her dreams and memories and chatting, we found that a number of years before that, she invited a number of friends up for a barbecue and her father was cooking on the barbecue and he didn't cook the chicken well enough and he, you know, there was food poisoning and they were all vomiting and it was all awful. And then he touched her head and she associated all this with illness and getting sick. So she couldn't open doors and touch things and she wanted to be very clean because if not, she would get dirty and food poisoning and die. That was all the fantasies that we were unraveling. So on the one hand, we were doing clinical work at the level of, of analysis. But then I was coming in and saying, in terms of the symptom, I was working logotherapeutically. So instead of telling her, like a CBT person would, reduce your um, cleaning your hands, I, I never mentioned cleaning hands. I said to her, can you get really dirty? And that's paradoxical attention. Franco said, what would it be like for one minute to tell our phobic patients to will the thing, the very thing they fear, will it on, mock the symptom through humour and exaggeration. And she said, to, she looked at me as if I too had, she said, what do you mean? Get dirty. I, I want to clean my hands. And I said, I want you to locate sources of dirt. You can start at my office. What about going around that painting and seeing if there's dirt? And I mean, she, she was quite resistant at the beginning. And then she said, well, my grandmother lives in this old house. Do you think I should go in there? I said, great, go in there. She had a pony. I said, jump on the pony and put your hands over him. The dog, when he was wet, put your hands in, you know, where the coal is. And she, and she kept asking, but do I clean my hands after that? And I just ignored her. I said, just get dirty. Come in next week. And I want you to give me examples of when you got dirty. And the following week, I want you to increase it and increase it. And slowly but surely, the total hyper-reflection on cleanliness dissipated because she realised she didn't die. She just got dirty and she could shake it off. Just so slowly over the next few weeks and months, it wasn't about CBT reducing, it was about just ignoring it. The symptom isn't worthy of, because whatever we put our attention on grows. So ignore it. So de-reflection is saying, just ignore it. Talk about other things, what are meaningful. Paradox intention comes in and says, Okay, now we're going to do the opposite. So if somebody says, I fear I'm going to have a heart attack when I speak in public, stand up, please, have a heart attack. Have one now, oh, and you can do better. People start giggling. And, and what happens is the anxiety dissipates. Yes. And you're freer. And that's what ultimately happened. She got down to two or three times a day washing her hands, as to seen from the hunger she was doing. And I phoned her mother, and six months later, I said, how is she doing? The symptoms did not return. So that's an example where something like logotherapy worked very well and worked better than CBT. CBT has its place, and I love some of it. I love the philosophical side, Epictetus. You could say it's almost a forerunner in the Stoics of CBT. It definitely has its place. It's not for everybody. Young has its place. But if you don't like symbols and myths, then young won't work. It's not that he or it doesn't work. It's to do with matching the patient, so-called, with the person. All the studies show it's not really the therapy itself, it's the person with whom they can relate and talk to and trust. So so that's a key factor. That makes sense. And I, I love that you provided us with an example of paradoxical intention. Um, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately and I knew I'd be able to ask you about it. And so it, it's to me, it's one of the more fascinating techniques in all of therapy. Sure. And of course, for everyone who hears it for the first time, completely counterintuitive and downright hilarious, honestly. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, like I was just reading the other day of examples of cases where par paradoxical intention was effective uh, on various Victor Frankl Institute, web Institute websites. And so, yeah, examples that have come up that reflect what you just shared is, you know, people with insomnia 
and how when the people get into this vicious cycle, of course, they can't fall asleep and then they try really hard to fall asleep. But all of that effort and strain exacerbates their insomnia. And so the paradoxical intention is, I'm actually going to try to stay awake. I want to stay awake. I don't want, I, I like this. I want to lay here with my I eyes. I said it to a friend recently. He owns a shop and he went back to his apartment. He said, I really have to take a nap during the day or else I just can't get through the, the second shift. And I said, oh, and he said, I said, what's the problem? He said, I'm not getting to sleep. And I said, why? And he said, well, I'm doing everything I should be doing. I'm taking off my clothes, going into bed, turning off the lights. And I was going, oh my God, no, no, no. That were hyper intention. It's too yeah. direct. It's like what Frankel says about success. Don't aim at success. Success like happiness cannot be pursued. Rather, it must ensue. It does so when we forget about it, like a butterfly or a cat. They come near us when we don't grab hold of them. We've got to let let it go. So I said to him, don't do that. Just stay in your clothes, stay in the living room and watch TV. And slowly he just fell off. So the natural organic rhythms of the body took place. Um, another lovely example, one of my favourites, years and years ago, I had just a guy coming in, he was a postman, and he was very upset because his daughter wore odd socks one Friday to school and she got teased. Now, I'm sure he must have come in with other complaints or issues, but I just remember this story about his daughter. And she's very, very upset and he wanted to know, is there anything quickly I could do about it? I said, absolutely. Phone the teacher and say, what would it be like every Friday to have an odd socks day? And encourage everybody to wear odd socks. And you walk in an odd socks and make a big joke about it. So some of the teachers thought this is a bit of fun. And then suddenly she moved from being really embarrassed and shy and, you know, felt she was being insulted and pointed at and laughed at to being the star of the show and creating this fun Friday where they all brought in odd socks and they were all very creative with clothing and they, I think there was once a month they kept continuing this approach so that's kind of paradoxical intention yeah. just moving in and redeeming and retrieving something at the level of humour at the level of hyperbole the level of creativity because it breaks the cycle of anticipatory anxiety Exactly. Exactly. Well said. Um, speaking of, you know, the techniques and logotherapy, I wanted to make sure we talked about paradoxical intention. So just to be crystal clear with our listeners, this is called paradoxical because you are intending on experiencing the very thing that you fear experiencing. And in a paradoxical way, that intention to experience it makes it less likely that you'll experience it or at least it eliminates the anxiety around it and I guess there's one more example that's coming to my mind even though I think people probably get it because you've given great examples but Frankel had a patient who would sweat every time he met new people and so he, he told Frankel like I swear I sweat a quart of sweat every time I meet a new person and Frankel's response was try to sweat 10 quarts yeah, of sweat see if you can sweat more yeah. And it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's an existentially funny, you know, it's yeah. like, a, it's so humorous yeah. that we would approach things like this. And paradoxically enough, you know, that man overcame yeah. his problem yeah. with sweating when meeting new people. The wish so, replaces the fear. And, and the funny thing is, Franco was, was, he was happy that the cognitive behaviorists and others kind of nicked it from him and never said he was the author of it. He was doing it in 1929, very early on. So he was he, he didn't mind his techniques being used, but he, he did mind that he that logotherapy wasn't given the um the source, wasn't wasn't shown up to be the source. So he didn't mind people using it. But he also said about it that it seems like a little behavioral trick. And it does work. And it can be presented as such, but it's much deeper because what is enabling that to happen is self-distancing. And we wouldn't be able to self-distance from the symptom if we were the symptom. So it's honouring our noetic capacity to self-distance, that the self is not the symptom, the person is not his pathology. So in his wonderful book um, on, on mental disorders, on the theory and therapy of mental disorders, he talks about, he says in a phrase, he calls it a psychiatric credo, that the spirit can never be sick. Access to it can be blocked, and that can originate a neurogenic neur neurosis. 
but the spirit itself can never be sick. And what he means by that is, if you have somebody in front of you who is who has schizophrenia or has got Alzheimer's, so one could be psychological or psychiatric, one could be neurological, there is still behind the illness if it's physical, or mental disorder, if it's psychological, there is still behind that the person intact. The spirit of the person is always intact and whole. They might be broken in the body and spirit. They're in their body and mind. They're not broken in spirit. There is in them uninjured humanity. And it is that noetic core that he wants to touch and trace and I remember uh, um, somebody came to me having been raped and we worked through it all and I said, you have been this appalling, disgusting, immoral, illegal blow of fate has been visited on you. And it broke your body and, and it hurt your mind. But your spirit was never touched by him. Never touched. Utterly free. And then you, of course, you do more work. But even hearing that made it feel somewhat, little bit better, slightly even, just to know that our dignity is intact because our dignity is not just related to our usefulness or our body or how we think, our feelings. There's much more going on. Um, so I think I put a little course together and put it on Udemy. You know, we've that thing, UDMI, just in paradoxical intention. And I got all the examples I could from the literature. I gave everything and just put it out there. So if people want to see that, it's only 20 euros or something. It's it, it could be worthwhile. It's literally just some paradoxical intention because I loved it like you. I loved it so much because you could use it. You could use it anywhere. And it wasn't a bit, you could just explain it, what's behind it, give a few examples, encourage it. And it just has a phenomenally high clinical success rate, way up in the 80s, 80 to 87, mm. which is normal for us to do just to immediately alleviate somebody's symptoms, you know? And the other one, the reflection, which kind of complements that, um, the reflection is almost, I mean, it sounds the opposite, but you can still do it with insomnia, for instance. The reflection is, let's say I'm hyper-reflecting over giving a talk. The reflection is just saying, look, take all this attention away from the ego, you know? put it on something more meaningful. So, for instance, I remember saying to a friend, well, what's going on when you go into a room? Everybody's looking at me. And I said, well, then de-reflect. Put a big screen there and write something outrageous on it so that I'll be looking at the screen. And then you can look at them and find yourself again. And you went, oh, right. So really simple, practical stuff, but it's deep. It works at a much deeper level. And, um, a, yeah, a lovely example of, on de-reflection, which is coming to mind, is from Iris Murdoch. Nothing to do a lot with therapy. Iris Murdoch, the Dublin-born um, philosopher, English philosopher, and um, novelist. And she gave a lovely example of, it was a student in his study, and I think she portrays him as bored, preoccupied, sullen, anxious, all his books are there and he's in he's he's hyperly reflected on his books. Franklin calls it hyper reflection, you know, this excess of self scrutiny. And he suddenly becomes aware of a kestrel, you know, this lovely bird, hovering outside the window. So what he does is he turns, like the prisoners in Plato's cave, they turn their attention outward, which is what you were saying earlier about logotherapy. Outward, not inward. You know, James Hillman, the young Ian, wrote a book called We've Had 100 Years of Psychotherapy and the World's Getting Worse. So we need to go out into the world and find meaning. So this boy turns his attention outward, puts it on the bird, and that moment isn't momentary but momentous. Iris Murdoch puts it this way, at that moment, all is kestrel. His whole consciousness is converted. It's it's qualitatively different than when he turns back to his study. Everything has changed. As Hopkins phrases it, it's, it's charged with the, with the grandeur of God. So everything in that moment has changed. So it's a kind of a spiritual experience, that the reflection. And we can will it on. We can create conditions that create that option or availability to us or for us. 
and I think you you said the phrase excessive self scrutiny, and I think that is that is the antithesis of dereflection. That is exactly what dereflection is meant to uh, offset yes. is excessive <laughs> self scrutiny, and I do think that it almost for some people excessive self scrutiny almost disguises itself as healthy reflection or self accountability and yet it to me it, it it's more like your attention has become trapped by cycles of thought that are very egocentric in the sense of in the sense of being just um completely focused on oneself yeah. and it becomes a terrible trap yeah. and and again the, the 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 disguise is that it's somehow productive or morally respectable because you're you know for example thinking about all the things you did wrong in your life and all the people you hurt in your past and you're you're beating yourself up about it and you on some level think you deserve to be beat up about it and and it's just this incredibly tiny point of view and dereflection that as i understand is meant to offset that exactly to offer an aerial view an eagle eye view a bigger perspective so that it's not all about the puny ego the i you know what iris murder calls the fat lying deceitful ego um i know recently a friend of mine said to me um you know, it's miserable weather, isn't it? And I just said, now, I didn't particularly like it lashing either. My ego is offended. It shouldn't rain on me, but snails and plants and grass need the rain. So I just said to him, miserable for you. And he got it. He said, oh, yeah, me. I said, we've got to share the planet. Can't be just about us. I mean, there's no misery in water. There's only miserable people. And that's about our outlook, our attitude. That's why Wittgenstein said, the world of the happy man is different from the world of the unhappy. What's different about it isn't the world itself, but our attitude to things. How we're thinking about it. So in a way, if we could engage in pure perception, see things as they are, sacramental seeing, to see, um, Patrick Kavner, the Irish poet said, to see the newness that is in every stale thing when we look at it as children rather than through the lenses, the psychic lenses of our background or class or education or ego. You know, some of we need to take off the glass and try and see things as they are in reality, not through projection. So it's about perception, not conception. Conception is my little story about that which is, and that interferes. So it, it, like get away from that, yeah. I like the way you put that very much. And it does strike me that you know, as I often think and share with students that, you know, the simple psychological principle that nothing about an external stimulus has to change in order for your experience of it to change. Mm -hmm. And that is because you can have things change within you that affect your perception of the world around you. And like you said, it's a great image of you know, the world is different for the happy and the unhappy person. But the truth is, externally, objectively speaking, the world is the same. They inhabit the same world. They are rained on by yeah. the same weather. And yet the perceptual, the perception of it and therefore the emotion of it and therefore the behavioral yeah. response to it is altogether different. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like, I so, mean, if it, Frankel and, and, and excuse me for interrupting him, Fire away, and maybe you're going to ask this, but I, I, it just struck me as important to say, Frankl talks about three sources of meaning, three ways to find meaning. But I think it links up with our discussion here. The first, not in necessarily this order, but one way to find meaning is through creations. Now, when we think of creations, we think of writing a book or a poem or a sonata or a symphony, but it's being creative, how I, how I tie my shoelaces, how I you know, relate to somebody. It could be a book. It could be something I've written. It could be a model airplane. All the things I've done or created or put out into the world. That's one source of meaning. So creations are what I give to the world. So I'm sending something out. The second source is experiences. Now that's something that comes into me. 
there are things I've received from the world. So all my experiences, love, hate, encounters, connections with people, all that stuff is experiences. So I love that the way Frankel ex um, expresses himself here. Creations are what I give out to the world. Experience what I receive from the world. And most people stop there. They say, what else is there? And at the top of the triangle, experiences and creations, on the top he puts attitude. And that's how we relate, how our mindset is set to all these experiences and behaviours. You know, what we're thinking. And that's where that comes in. Our attitude, especially to suffering. And he, had, he puts forward a case what he calls the case for tragic optimism. You know, tragic optimism. Because... He's aware that there's the tragic triad of human existence, suffering, guilt, and death. But there's also healing, meaning, and forgiveness. So he's not a humanistic hopeful. He's a product of the concentration camps. But he's not a pessimist. So he's what he calls a tragic optimist. Always say yes to life in spite of everything. But know that there's still that tragic dimension. But you're always trying to wrest meaning from it and doing our best. So... Meaning is in the world to be discovered. It's not made up by me. So he's not a constructivist. But even though meaning is objective in the sense it's out there with things to do, experience or creations, you also have to make it meaningful for me. So put the me in meaning. You know, so M-E, me, A-N-I-N-G. So you are, he's holding the tension of what's objective and subjective. But without dissolving it into a kind of naive realism, just about doing stuff out there, forget my consciousness, or collapsing it into a kind of subjectivism or idealism mm. and leaving the world. It's kind of both. It's phenomenological. It's an existential perspectivalism. Um, mm. Sorry, I shouldn't really say it's perspectivalism, because that implies that it's just a perspective, and there isn't such a thing as ultimate meaning. Frankl believes there is, actually. He says the subject of meaning, that's logotherapy. It's all about the meanings of the moment. So it's kind of lowercase pluralized meanings. What about the meaning of life? He was asked that once and he said, it's like asking a chess player, what's the best move? The best move is simply the move that's the, the called for within the context of the game itself. So religion, which is not logotherapy, logotherapy can bring you to the door of transcendence, but that's as much as it can do. Religion, he defines as the fulfillment of the will to ultimate meaning. Fulfillment of the will to ultimate meaning. And of course, there's a connection. What is to do with sanity, logotherapy, what is to do with salvation? But there's crossovers and, and byproducts and side effects of both. Um, mm. But yeah, he is clear with our how we find meaning. It's not just what we give or take and receive. It's about What's going on up there? Everywhere. I mean, they say, you know, um, golf. Golf is a game that you play in your mind. But almost everything is. It's how we how we approach that which is. Do we accommodate to it or do we try and assimilate us to, to that to us, to our thinking? That's kind of being tension. So um, there's a lot of subtle philosophy and, and deep psychological wisdom, I think, in Frankel. And he writes beautifully, and all his books keep returning to the same point again and again about what it means to be human, and what it means to be a human being in search of meaning. Yes, there's a equation that he articulates, and I, I have only heard him talk about it in live interviews. Um, which is D equals S minus M. And I know you know that what he meant by that was despair is suffering without yeah. meaning. And so I would love to hear you elaborate on that, yeah. provide your interpretation on that. What does that mean? So uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, algorithm. Despair is suffering without meaning. Now, I'll give you a concrete clinical case history. It was an elderly GP who visited Franco. And his wife had died previously. And he felt he couldn't get over the loss of his wife. And he himself became suicidal. And he went to Frankel. And it was only one session. And Frankel said to him, OK, tell me what would have happened 
if you'd have died first? And he said, well, she wouldn't have been able to cope at all. She would have had a breakdown or she would want to kill herself. And Frankel said, let your suffering become the meaning of a sacrifice. You spared her that. You spared her that because you're alive. She died, so you spared her all that suffering. So now, instead of killing yourself, take on board the meaning of a sacrifice. Your suffering isn't futile or meaningless. It has assumed the status of a sacrifice for your dead, beloved wife. And I'm sure he said more about there are things that you can do in the world. Um, and he went out into the world as actually GP. And by all accounts, he was extraordinary. All the things he did in his village, all the things he had with people. So he made peace with it in one session with Frankel. And I think Frankel relates that session and saying he, his eyes were, he tears in his eyes and he just touched Frankel's hand on the way out and walked out of the office. So that's where despair was eased when he saw some meaning in his appalling suffering. He couldn't bring back his wife, but what he could do was change his attitude to her death and see it in a new light. And like you're saying, it it didn't make the grief dissipate no. necessarily, no. but it, it didn't, it made it so that there was meaning in the yeah. suffering and therefore, For that. Is that, that's, it's so true that, that we experience complete despair, just this depressed, hopeless state where we've lost the will to live when we're suffering and it feels completely pointless yeah. and meaningless and that there's no value whatsoever yeah. in the suffering. Yeah. I think this is crucial for people to understand because as you acknowledged in the very beginning of our conversation, we are all suffering. Yeah. That is that is one of the noble truths. Yeah, being right. Alive, the Buddha got that right. We suffer. And in a way, I mean, if you look at depression, this is another interesting thing. If Frankel is right, which I think he is, that we have a soma, our body, psyche, and noose, then depression can manifest in these three different ways. Now, there are no pure cases. Everything is mixed up and mongrelized and confused anyway. But there would be a more of a somatic depression, what Franklin calls a somatic, somatogenic origin in the body depression, like a chemical imbalance, perhaps. I, I don't know too much about that psychiatric stuff because there's a lot of controversy over what's biochemical and what's not. But let's just say the old-fashioned word manic depression or somebody bipolar, it seems biological, more biological, let's say, than psychological. And I've certainly had patients that I've seen that right up front and some course of psychopharmacological intervention, psychiatric treatment has been good for them, some um, medication. <laughs> I, I agree that there's a pill for every ill. We medicalize our suffering and our sadness. So all sadness is depression and a pill for every ill so that somebody's just put on stuff and it's contained, it's not cured. Maybe death is the only cure, um, as Lacan says, because we can't we can't stop being human. Um, however, that could be one form that depression takes, and therefore, if you know the etiology then you might, and the phenomenology, the description, you might be able to match it with some treatment modality. But the second one would be a more uh, new, uh, not neogenic, psychogenic depression, where it's reactive. It's the result of something happening, like the breakup of a love relationship or the loss of loved object, to put it in more Freudian terms. And that would necessitate perhaps, perhaps not medication, but psychotherapy. And of course, there's primary and secondary depression. Or it gets complicated. The third, the neogenic depression, as Frankel says, that distress, which is existential, isn't a mental disorder. So there's no point putting that person on medication. That's philosophical. That's spiritual. That's the suffering of a soul who's lost its meaning. Could be the teenager. Could be somebody who's made unemployed. Could be anybody in any circumstance. It's not as if it's a, a psychogenic or reactive depression, nor is it a, a somatogenic or biological or psychotic depression. It's something else going on. It's a kind of spiritual distress or it's an existential depression. And, and we need to be quite clear as to how they're manifesting differently because, you know, 
Plato sometimes is better than Prozac or meditation better than medication and sometimes the reverse. So I think that's quite good that Frankl's theory uh, influences the way he practices. So the theory is important. Mm. Yes, and I, you, you make a very good point, you know, that the etiology of a condition should shape the treatment yeah. approach and that whatever condition we're talking about, depression, anxiety, could potentially have biological roots. I'm convinced that the chemical imbalance theory is simply not nearly precise yeah. enough and yeah. lacks evidence. Yeah. However, I definitely acknowledge that there can be biological roots to a condition and they may be a neurological condition, yeah. it may relate to hormones, it may relate to nutrient deficiencies, sleep deprivation, many possible biological causes. And then as you're saying, and there are possible psychological causes like the trauma of past experiences yeah. or the way in which we've been conditioned yeah. to think and feel. Um, and then, so, so how might you uh, discern what, whether this is a sort of, you know, which level this is coming from, particularly differentiating between the psychological, the psychogenesis and the spiritual? Well, it's to try and discover the precipitating events and the way, so when somebody comes in and, my, and they might say to me, sometimes when they refer to me by psychiatrist, they give me the sheet, you know, and it has generalized anxiety disorder. <coughs> that's what happened um, relatively recently. Now, when I see that, I know that that's a language game. And I don't know what it means. I mean, I said to the patient at the time, generalized anxiety disorder, but what might non-generalized anxiety be like? And they said, oh, what? I said, well, isn't anxiety by definition generalized? Because if it was specific, it would be fear. Right. Anxiety as an object, uh, sorry, fear as an object, anxiety doesn't. Right. It's objectless right. fear. True. And she went, oh. And I said, and now let's look at the word disorder. Disorder, you're not in order. I mean, I quite like that word if, if, it, if it's meant in a platonic sense, but if it's meant in a biological or psychiatric or moral sense mm. I don't particularly like it so I said to her what do you think order means do you feel your life is in order so we actually analysed those words for a while and then we came to anxiety and I said to her do you have so much anxiety that you feel you're not living productively or meaningfully that it's tripping you up all the time that it's permanent and repetitive so that's kind of psychological anxiety and she said yes and we worked on that but if somebody, if she'd have said no I would have said, well, that's kind of existential anxiety. And we're all anxious. I mean, Kierkegaard in one of his notebooks said, um, everything in existence makes me anxious from the smallest fly to the mysteries of the incarnation. You know, and Beckett said, you're on earth, you're on earth, there's no cure for that. So we just have to get on with something. So I have to realise this anxiety about my finitude in the future or finances or friendship that's just part of being human. It's That's the existential part of logotherapy, that it's a way of being in the world, you know, and it's not about curing that or doing something with it. It's just knowing it, realising it, talking about it. So you find out enough about the person, about their experience. Always ask, what's your experience of depression or anxiety? Because sitting there, I don't know what they're talking about, until they give me their experience. And then you might work out what it sounds like or the precipitating events. I mean, I recall a logotherapist friend of mine from Germany <coughs> saying that the most wonderful uh, logotherapy, the most wonderful. And I said, oh, who did you go to? And he said, Joseph Pieper. And Joseph Pieper, who I met once in UCD, University College Dublin, when he was in his late 80s or 90s, is a really famous German philosopher. He's not a psychotherapist. He's a Thomist, he's a Catholic philosopher. And this German friend said, he did therapy. I said, what you did therapy? How? And he said, by inviting me into his house and having the most amazing philosophical chats once a month. And he said, I came out in a high and all my problems seemed diminished, dissipated, because he was putting his attention with this amazing philosopher up there on the metaphysical realities. Now, that's not going to work for everybody. If he was psychogenically depressed that's not going to work but because he was existentially 
distressed and despairing and wondering about meaning, he talked to this most amazing philosopher and they had such good chats that he regarded that as a form of logotherapy. So logotherapy is in every therapy. It's in every great, meaningful, deep conversation or light, humorous, non-deep conversation wherever two or three people touch on meaning, touch on something that's shared, that has value and spiritual significance in a non-religious sense. And it can be religious, of course, I've no problem with that. That is logotherapy. It's just always oriented in our lives and something bigger than us on the logos. And whether you go in a religious way, John's gospel in the beginning was the logos, the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Without him was not anything made that was made. That's the logos in religion. But there's the logos in psychology, which is spirit or meaning. And our lives are ameliorated in our orientation to something other than just our small little ego, what Hopkins calls our small sweaty self. It's to see the big picture, that the self with a big S, our true self, uh, that's our essence, mm -hmm. our essential nature. And the more we get in touch with the ground of our own being, the happier, the steadier, the more meaningful our life is. Beautifully said. And that makes me want to highlight, you know, I really feel like in Frankel's work, in, you know, the body of work that has now surrounded his work, all of the philosophers and psychologists who have added their commentary and contributed have really put their finger on the secret to happiness. And in my view, the secret to happiness is a meaningful life. And you even said this earlier that happiness, like Frankl said, is not meant to be pursued as an end in itself. And that, as he would often say, you know, he'd say like, I, I hate to contradict the Declaration of Independence, especially when he would give talks in the US, but the pursuit of happiness is self-defeating. Because if you pursue it as an a end in itself, you'll never hit it because it's not meant to be pursued. And as you said earlier, it's meant to be ensue. It's, it's meant to ensue I mean, from a meaningful Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. That's it in a nutshell. I, I think my diplomat project was on writing on a long essay on happiness, which I became a book, uh, which I wrote many years ago called The Ethics of Happiness, an existential analysis. And in it, I looked at what Aristotle had said, what all the philosophers said, and of course concluded with Frankel. And uh, I put up my own scheme, which which um, I'll share with you, which is the difference. I subsequently added a word in a later book, but anyway, um, pleasure, happiness, joy. Now I've added bliss. This is kind of my little mm -hmm. schema, but based on Frankel's work. Pleasure and happiness are sometimes confused. You know, when Aristotle says the aim of life is happiness and pleasure, they use eudaimonia which is a kind of spiritual happiness, a flourishing. Yeah. It isn't chasing pleasure. I mean, happiness as pleasure is eudoxus. Happiness as pleasure is Freud. But there's different grades. It's the, the hedonistic treadmill. If we're constantly chasing pleasure, we don't get it because desire is metonymical. It's endlessly deferred, endlessly displaced. That's why capitalism works so well and so perversely because it keeps promising us happiness when we attain this object of desire. And then it leads us to beat it until we get another one. And on and on and on it goes. So you can have pleasure without happiness. Happiness is a higher pleasure, if you like. You can have pleasure without happiness, but you can't have happiness without pleasure. And you can have joy without happiness, but you can't have... You can have joy... You can't have joy without happiness. It carries it so that the higher joy includes but transcends the lower. So you can have pleasure without happiness, you can have happiness without joy, but you can't have joy without both happiness and pleasure. So each one is carried. It's just the same if you get a sheet of paper and say a paragraph. A paragraph is made up of words. They're made up of letters. You can have letters without words, but you can't have words without letters. And on and on it goes. So there's a difference between pleasure, happiness and joy. So I try to, well, I think there is, and I was working it out with lots of quotes from different people. But here's the thing. If you align that with Frankel's tridimensional ontology, what you get is this. Pleasure is somatic. Happiness is psychical. Joy is noetic. Nice. Does that make sense? So I, I thought that was a nice scheme. I tried to work that out. Now, then I got into other stuff. And I thought, what about bliss? I mean, some people talk about bliss. And I felt, okay, that's 
that's if that is spiritual, it's transcendent. So it could be something like the Holy Spirit at work in us. So it's not just my spirit, new, um, uh, no, um, the noetic, but it's pneumatic with a P. It's the Holy Spirit. So you can talk about pleasure, happiness, joy, bliss, soma, psyche, noose, pneuma. So that's ultimately where I went in another book. So just in case people read the ethics of happiness and, uh, you know, I added to that at a later book, I added bliss. But I, I just yeah. think that makes sense that um, sometimes, now, any, any schema like this, I wouldn't like to put it forward too statically or too rigid. It's fluid and it's, it's you know, they interpenetrate. Of course they do. But, but I do think you're right that this notion of, you know, happy Christmas, we're going to have a great day, all this hyper-reflection, all it does is increases anxiety. And what we really need to do is just let go of the hyper-reflection, let go of the hunch for happiness or money or a romantic partner. Just enjoy that which is and all these things will be given us, you know. So Franco would just say, put meaning first, push just to something that's meaningful, that contributes, you know. So ask ourselves, what's our legacy to life? What's our contribution to creation? What impact do we want to have in this world? Meet the need and just try and forget about this narcissistic imposter called the false self or ego. Because that should be, you know, in the symphony playing its violin, it shouldn't be directing the show. The self should be directing the show. So it's the kind of um, gear shift. It's it's a it's a, yeah. it's an ontological pivoting or pirouetting from the ego to the self, and that's a much healthier, much bigger life as well. Right. Well, maybe my you know final contribution to our conversation here to our listeners is that the thing I'd like to really emphasize about everything we've talked about is the importance of finding meaning in suffering. And I know that so many people, especially people who might be listening, who are interested in drawn to psychology podcasts, uh, have their experiences with depression, with anxiety, with grief, with all of the ways we suffer. And I guess my invitation to listeners would be to aim to discover what it is that the ways in which the suffering you're experiencing makes you uniquely equipped to help other people. And I just think that when that becomes our mentality, a person can almost begin to look at their depression as like, oh, this is good. This is really helping me glean insight into the nature of this experience such that I will be extremely well qualified to help other people professionally or informally um, because other people are going to need you, listener. Um, and all of the suffering you've experienced is going to ultimately become a source of wisdom. So that's my last contribution to our conversation. Is there is there anything you'd like to say as a, as a message to our listeners who are dealing with... Well, just Nick, on that, I would say this, that once years ago, um, maybe 10 years ago, um, I was seeing a patient and they left. And I got a phone call to tell me my best friend had died. He was suicide. And I was totally stunned. And within four minutes, another patient came into the room. And I remember in the first 10 minutes thinking, I don't think I can survive this session. I'm not really listening. I'm not in the room. And we're told to be in the room without memory or desire. No past, no future, being in the present, which is the imminent transcendent absolute, the meaning of the moment, always be in the present. And I couldn't be because I was suffering. I kept thinking of my friend who just killed himself in the funeral and everything. And I don't know where it came from, some frankal message saying, push your attention on the face opposite you and on her suffering. And I did, and my own suffering was transformed. And I did feel that uh, at the time, viscerally, that the more I listened to her and her suffering, the more whatever I was enduring was being subdued and a different kind of energy was emerging. And um, I not only got through the session, I mean, it is weird maybe to say it, I kind of enjoyed it. And 
I then suffered at the funeral and and all that. But all the time, any time I remembered that, I kept putting my attention to whoever was in front of me, who is my teacher, whoever's in front of us in the present moment is our teacher, especially putting it through the senses. I often say to people, very anxious, name five things you can see, four things you can smell, three things you can taste, etc. Go to the senses. It brings us into the immediacy of the present moment. And, and really, so so I was there, I felt that, and I endured it, and I enjoyed it. And the two aren't contradictory. Life is this amalgam of all these things. So we can get through, a, you know, as Nietzsche said, we are the most adaptable of creatures. We don't court suffering, but you'd be amazed at your spiritual resources. I mean, Frankel ends his book by saying, man is that being who invented the gas chambers of Auschwitz. But... He is also the same being who went into them head upright with the Lord's Prayer or the Shema Israel on his lips. So that's our, what he calls, defiant power of the human spirit. That's our innate and inner resilience. And that's there to you. And that and other people and events and meaning will conspire to aid you and get you through it. And also to distinguish between psychological depression and spiritual desolation or the dark night of the soul. They're, they're, qualitatively different even though they might overlap and that sometimes therapy will work other times medication other times an extraordinarily wise old man or woman will help so traumatic close off all the sources and all of us of course will will offer us something by way of meaning and purpose well I must admit Dr. Costello, this is our 55th Ooh. episode of this podcast, and this has been one of my favorite, wow. for sure. Um, just profound and inspiring, and I just love the way, you know, your, y you speak and how all, all the quotes just flow out of you off the top of your head, and you have the right quote for every topic, and, and so much context around all of these topics so much professional experience applying the techniques what a, what a special human being you are so thank you for joining me. a real pleasure and, and thank you so much for those kind undeserving remarks but uh, if 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 they help anybody or if people want to read frankel there's no no better man to read the 20th century than somebody who had endured so much suffering himself and found a way to deal with his own blows of fate i mean he was suicidal after the camps and he went back to his empty house, but he built a life. And no matter what we're suffering, no matter how old we are facing an inoperable cancer, our life can be retroactively flooded with meaning. So m many thanks for this great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And it was a, a pleasure and a privilege to talk to you and meet you as well. Thank you. We'll stay in touch. And thank you everyone for listening and watching. Until next time. Oh,